Managing your law practice can be challenging. Marketing, time management, attracting clients, and all the things besides the cases that you need to do that aren't billable. Welcome to this edition of the Unbillable Hour, the Law Practice Advisory Podcast. This is where you'll get the information you need from expert guests and host Christopher Anderson, here on Legal Talk Network. Welcome to the Unbillable Hour. I am your host, Christopher Anderson. And today's episode is about, well, it's about law firm growth, both in revenues, but also in things that you need to take care of in the growth. Because today my guest is a lawyer with a tremendous amount of experience, uh, over 30 years of building his own, two of them, seven-figure law firms. And now he also shares his knowledge and experience with attorneys across the country, helping them experience exponential growth in their law firms, including really importantly, because growth is really kind of pointless without increased profits, um, which he helps with, as well as uh, ethical market preeminence. So we're going to hear what he has to say about all of that. The title of the show is Law Firm Growth is No Accident. And my guest, if you haven't guessed already, is Ken Hardison. He's the founder of PILMA, uh, which is the Powerful Innovative Legal Marketing and Management Association, which has dedicated itself to helping lawyers learn the critical strategies to success. But before we hear more from Ken, we have to do a little business and hear a word from our sponsors. Alert Communications. If any law firm is looking for call, intake, or retainer services available 24-7-365, just call 866-827-5568. Scorpion is the leading provider of marketing solutions for the legal industry. With nearly 20 years of experience serving attorneys, Scorpion can help you grow your practice. Learn more at scorpionlegal.com. Law Clerk, where attorneys go to hire freelance lawyers. Visit lawclerk.legal to learn how to increase your productivity and your profits by working with talented freelance lawyers. LawYaw provides end-to-end document automation for solo, small, and mid-sized practices. Save time and avoid mistakes with documents that you draft over and over again. Learn more at lawyaw.com, and that's L-A-W-Y-A-W.com. And today's episode of the Unbillable Hour is Law Firm Growth is No Accident. And once again, I am very pleased to introduce my guest, Ken Hardison. Ken is a trusted advisor, a coach. He's a mastermind mentor um, and has been coaching lawyers to greater success time and time again. He teaches lawyers on the latest legal management and marketing strategies, such as leveraging SEO or search engine optimization, PPC or pay-per-click, PPL, I'll ask him what that means, social media, et cetera. Ken is also the host of his own podcast called the Grow Your Law Firm Podcast and author of the best-selling books, Systematic Marketing and Under Promise, Over Deliver. Ken, welcome to the program. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here, my friend. It is absolutely my pleasure to have you. So my intros are notoriously short and inadequate. Um, so if you wouldn't mind, Ken, just let's start by understanding your background. What brought you to be helping other lawyers grow their business? You know, I, um, yeah, it's a long story, but I'll try to make it short. Uh, <laughs> bottom line is first 14 years, I was just like every other lawyer, just doing the best I could, you know, getting by with no marketing, no management, just, you know, people come in, referrals, whatever. And uh, a couple of things happened. My business started going down. I went to court one day and saw this gentleman uh, that I was representing on a DWI with crutches. And I said, what happened, Joe? He said, I got T-boned by uh, by 18-wheeler. I said, well, you know, I do those cases. He said, yes, but uh, I hired this guy off TV because I figured he must be good. And uh, very upsetting because I knew the lawyer. He never tried a case in his life. Yeah. Really a great marketer. And so I went, I tried his DWI, I won it. I went back to my office, talked to my two partners and they uh, told him that we had to change, you know, that things were changing and they wouldn't didn't agree with me. So about six months, I went out and started my own law firm and uh, took one lawyer and two staff, maybe three staff and uh, had to start from scratch. And uh, wow, yep. yeah. And so that was in like 96, 97. And I, I, I studied, uh, went around the law, the, the country at, you know, shadowing different successful lawyers, going to different events that had nothing to do with law firms, reading every book mm, I could yeah. read. And um, we grew it from that in like six years to like 13 lawyers, 47 staff. And uh, 
even got it going better. And then one morning I just woke up to be honest with you. And, uh, I'm kind of entrepreneurial and I said, you know, I want to do something else. I'm not looking forward to going into office today. And so I, I sold out and, uh, moved down to the beach and I thought I was going to just take it easy. And, uh, Lawyers were calling me all over the country, emailing me, you know, asking for advice. And I said, you know, I need to start charging for this. And, 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 <laughs> yeah. and plus, you know, the deal was I was getting bored. I, I can't play with so much golf play, and fish so much. And so I started Pilma and uh, it just kind of took off. You know, the first it was kind of like a hobby, but now it's got to be a big business. I mean, it's a seven figure business too, you know. And then when I got down here, somebody said, well, you know, you had a lot of money when you started your own firm and I didn't have that much money, but I did go out and get a big line of credit. And so I started another firm just with $6,000 a month as my budget for marketing and grew it in about there you 800 go. cases, seven, 800. And then we, uh, we sold it after about two years. I proved you don't have to have loads of money. I mean, you can do it a lot quicker with loads of money, but you really need to do it smarter. So that's kind of my background. And now you know, I've got it. I've been in masterminds my whole life. Either you know, all I'm into right now, and then I facilitate five different ones. And I like coaching. I just like really helping lawyers uh, grow their practices. I mean, you know, because yeah, they don't teach you that in law school. And, and believe me, I didn't have anybody to teach me. I had to learn by trial and error. And it costs you a lot of money. A lot of money. Yeah. And I think I, I really love the story about the second firm, about the fact that you started it on you know six thousand dollars a month in marketing. Yeah. There's a great book um, by Damon John. The title is escaping me at the moment. Um, it's like The Power of Broke, I, I think, is what the title is. But anyway, uh, Damon John doesn't have that many books, and this this one's good. But it, it's, I think, the fact that you did that was a great proving ground for the people who want to say that, yeah, you know, Ken Hardison's got a big firm because Ken Hardison has a big firm, and I have a little firm, so I can't be Ken Hardison. It's bullshit. Like you don't need the big resources. You don't need a lot of money, like you said. And in fact, I think sometimes, and I've seen it happen, a lot of money is sometimes a recipe for making a lot of big mistakes and losing a lot of money. Yeah, especially when you just try to grab the next shiny thing. And that's what I see, you right. know, and that's what lawyers do. They're looking for the silver bullet and, and it doesn't exist. If it does exist, I would have found it long ago <laughs> and, and sold it. Uh, <laughs> it. I mean, there there is no one thing. There's a lot of things. I mean, you know, when I was marketing my big firm, I was doing 32 different things to market the firm. Some cost zero, some cost, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, uh, you know? Yeah. The, the truth though, is that when we look out there, there's, you know, hundreds of thousands of solo, small law firms, three lawyers, four lawyers, five lawyers, two lawyers, and most of them don't figure it out. And they think there's a big secret but it's really more about what's keeping them back. So what would you say like the three biggest things are that are holding law firm owners back from growing or scaling their own yeah. law practices? Well, one of the biggest things is your mindset because lawyers are trained to think about and, and analyze what can go wrong instead of how you can do, you know, how you can get over the obstacle. They're looking for landmines all the time and, well, we can't do this because of this or we can't do that. You got to reverse that mindset. Mindset is what if, why can't? You know, and then, and then really the other two big deals or, or three big deals is you don't have the right people. You know, you cannot do it by yourself. You've got to find people. Uh, Vern Harness said it really great in his book, Scale It Up. No great company will ever build on the back of average employees. And, and, yeah. and I've always been, I've always let my ego go and hire people that were a lot smarter than I am, you know. And it doesn't bother me. You know, some lawyers can't do that. And if your ego is so big, you can't do that. Then you, you, you're never going to grow. I can tell you that. And then execution. And that's where I see most lawyers, they, they, oh, they want to do it. And then they say, I just so busy, you know, I just, you know, just didn't get to it. And, and, and my deal is we all do everything that we really, really want to, you know, when you really yeah. want to do it, you make time to do it. So, do you really want it bad enough? I mean, you know, here's the bottom line. Do you really want it bad enough? And then you got to have cash flow, you know, and we, we can talk about that later. But I think, you know, the big deal is probably the top two is execution and, and uh, you know, implementation and, and mindset. I mean, I think that really holds people back is the, they're looking ways for it not to work instead of ways for it to work, you know? I got it. And, and, and to your point, I mean, I think the, actually one of the last points you made kind of goes across of them 
because I don't know about you, but let me just do a quick test. How many hours are in each of your days? I have 24 in mind. How many you I have? have? 24. Yeah. And you, you have seven day weeks like me? Yep. And so we each have 168 hours, as does every single lawyer listening and every single lawyer out there. So I think the, the point that you made was like being busy, like everybody's yeah. busy. Everybody is fully booked every day, every minute of every day, people are doing something. You might be playing, I don't know, Diamond Dash or Crystal game or whatever, or being on Facebook or watching television, or like you said, uh, playing golf, but you're doing something. And so really the question, it sounds like what you're saying is basically like, it's, it's about choosing what you're using that time to do yeah. and making better choices. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, that's the big lie. You know, what I see is the two, I've, you know, I've been doing this for a long time. I've been coaching and lawyers for over 10 years now, and I've seen and a lot of masterminds. And I can tell you that really successful lawyers or any kind of business people, they got two big traits, characteristics. They're very focused. And they're very disciplined. What I mean by that is, if you think about it, if you're focused on something, that your goal, and you're kind of driven, you're not going to let anything get in the way. And that, 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 and you're not going to have that excuse, well, I didn't have time. Uh, and then if you got the discipline to get it done, it, it, you're not going to let any obstacles get in your way. I mean, I, I still have this with people. Somebody say, Ken, there's no way we can do this. I said, oh, but there is, my friend. I said, you know. Uh, we are going to get it done and we are going to get it done by this date. And here's how we're going to do it. You know, and if we got to hire some more people, then we'll hire some temps. But the deal is you don't let things get it. You don't, you know, you've got to have be very laser focused and disciplined. And then the deal is what I say a lot of lawyers is they just, uh, and I don't like you call it management of time anymore, but, but the yeah. deal is they, they don't use their time properly. What I'm saying is they, they, I call them time vampires and they let people, <laughs> Uh, people will suck the life out of you if you let them. Uh, you know, I've got several things I teach at Pilmo, uh, and one of them is about the got a minutes. Uh, you know, <laughs> you yeah. know they'll, they'll kill you. I mean, especially if you're the head of the firm and you're walking down the hallway, you'll get 20 of them before you get to the end of the hall, and you got to stop that, you know. And I, I don't want to get at all into that today because that's a whole, you know, 30 minute to uh, seminar. You mentioned Vern Hardish. I want to just see if you remember this because like that just triggered a memory and that your thought about these got a minutes. But Vern Hardish in, in scaling up talks about I think it's Charles Schwab uh, was having trouble in his early days getting focused and getting things done in his business. Um, do you remember that story? I don't, but I remember. Okay, well, I'll, I'll tell it. You comment okay. on it. <laughs> um, so, but basically, he hired a consultant. And the consultant, I mean, the, the advice he got, and the consultant's deal was, I'll give you the advice, and you use it for a little while, and then you write me a check for whatever you think it was worth. And this is like 1971, 1972. And the consultant's advice was simply, write a list in order of the most important things you, you need to get done tomorrow. So do this at the end of the day. Yeah. And then tomorrow morning, get to work, and don't allow anything or anyone to talk to you or interrupt you until you get number one done. That was it. That was the whole advice. Yeah. And he said, because if most people would just get the most important thing done each day, they'll be way ahead of others. Absolutely. Does that sound, does that sound simpatical with what you're talking yeah, about? I mean, you know what I do every day and I still do it to this day. I've got a checklist of things to do and I got one that I'm writing new things on and I got one that I'm marking out the things that, but then I, at the end of the day, I sit down and I rank them with A's, mm -hmm. B's and C's, A's I got to get done the next day. And then if it's something I want to get done the first thing, it becomes a double A. And then what you got to do is, like I tell these lawyers, you got to make an appointment with yourself. You know, the deal is, instead of, if you, if you got to do it before you get in the office, then do it. But where you go in the office, you shut yourself up and have an hour by yourself or whatever and and just tell people, don't bother me unless the building's on fire. I mean, yeah, that's the bottom line. That's exactly right. You know? So we're, we're going to take a moment here and uh, – get this show paid for uh, by having a word from our sponsors. And when we come back, I'm going to try to shift a little bit with you and start talking because you made a couple of comments as we went about not being able to build a great business with average team. And so I want to talk to you about getting 18 players on your team and on other lawyers' teams. But first, we'll hear a word from our sponsors. As the largest legal-only call center in the U.S., Alert Communications helps law firms and legal marketing agencies with new client intake. Alert captures and responds to all leads 24-7, 365 as an extension of your firm in both English and Spanish. Alert uses proven intake methods, 
customizing responses as needed, which earns the trust of clients and improves client retention. To find out how Alert can help your law office, call 866-827-5568 or visit alertcommunications.com forward slash LTN. Law Clerk is where attorneys go to hire freelance lawyers. Whether you need a research memo or a complicated appellate brief, our network of freelance lawyers have every level of experience and expertise. Sign up is free and there are no monthly fees. Only pay the flat fee price you set. Use rebate code UNBILLABLE to get a $100 Amazon gift card when you complete your next project. Learn more at lawclerk.legal. We're back with the Unbillable Hour. We're talking to Ken Hardison. He's the founder of PILMA, the powerful, innovative legal marketing and management association. We've been talking about mindset, first of all, just to what some of the things that are holding lawyers back and how to kind of get on top of your day and not succumb to the, and I'll just go out there and say the word, excuse that you're too busy because we're all equally busy. Everybody's day is fully booked. It's just a matter of doing the things that are most important. Um, but in the first segment, Ken talked about uh, not being able to build a great business on average team players. So I want to talk to you about that, Ken. What do you What do you mean by that? And how do we? I think we're a lot of lawyers feel plagued by having a team that's not the one they would want, or not the one they hope they'd have, or just they feel like it's not supporting them, but they're not able to do better. What do, What do you mean by that? And how do you do better? Yeah, I think what they do is they accept mediocrity, and I think that's uh, if you want to build a big business, whether whether it's a law firm or anything, you cannot do that. Yeah, I mean, what I mean by this is, is you want people, you know, you want as many A players as you can get because A players are going to do about one and a half to two times more than your B or your C players. And and people say, I can't afford these people, but you, <laughs> but you can't afford not to get them because if they're going to, if you can get them to do twice as much work, you can pay them one and a half times more and still come out ahead, right? Right. Right. And the deal is you want these as many as you can get. It's going to be hard to get all A players, but you definitely don't want any C's. And uh, and B's, you want those coachable to, where you can you see some possibilities of growth into an A player. And so yeah. uh, Pat Licioni wrote a book or several books. One of them was the five dysfunctions of a team. The other one was the, the A team player. And he said there's three characteristics you want to look for in an A player. Uh, they got to be hungry. And that don't mean just hungry for money, but hungry for advancement, knowledge, growth, individual growth. Uh, and they got to be humble. They, they, I mean, they got to be confident, but they can't think they know it all. What I'm saying is they got to, they can't have an ego so big that, that, you know, you can't get a word in edgewise. And then they got to be smart, but not the kind of smart you think about, not an IQ smart, a people smart. I call it you know, being able to deal with people and intertwine and, you know, have interpersonal relationships with your coworkers. And I've seen this. I've had to fire somebody that was brilliant, but he was an asshole to deal with. I mean, he was just rude to people. And I said, you just don't talk to people like that. You know, I don't care how smart you are. I mean, I, do, I really, when it comes down to it, I don't care who you are or how much you know. If you don't fall in those three categories, you're not going to work for my business, whether it's a law firm or PILMA or whatever it is. Sure. And, and you know, because I would suggest everybody go out and read that book, uh, the eight, and then if you want to read the five dysfunctions, but it's Pat Licioni. Uh, he writes a book that's very easy to read. It, it's almost like the E-Myth in it. It's like a story. Yeah. Yeah. He writes you know, in parable. A parable, a parable uh, so to speak. So it's very easy to read. Even, you know, I make uh Part of our deal here, I think part of your deal as a leader is you should be training and coaching your people. And so I make my people read a book. They can read it on my time. And we have a discussion about it at the end of the month at our monthly meetings. And uh, we've read both of those books. And so then they get an idea of what I'm looking for. And when we're hiring other people, what we're looking for. And I think the big deal is if you lose somebody, you think you got to replace them overnight. And the deal is don't do that. Right. I call it the knee jerk reaction. You want to, you know, the old saying is hire slow and fire fast. Well, that really is true. Let me ask you about this, the flip side of that. Cause I, I, I often see this other question about uh, sometimes a lawyer will say, you know, this perfect person has come along, but I don't have room for them right now. Um, what about, you know, if you come across an 18 player that, uh, you know, what do you do? You hire them. Yeah. If I ever come across somebody like that, I make room for them. 
because they're so hard to find, Chris, and they're so hard to keep. And that's the other thing. you got to keep them once you get them. And to do that, you've got to give them opportunity for growth and you've got to give them good feedback, you know, and uh, appreciate them. I see so many people say, well, I pay them a good salary. Well, well that people want a lot more than that. They want to feel like they're part of something bigger, which most lawyers are. They're seeking justice. Yeah, and they're they're trying to right wrongs and things like that. So that lawyers have got that pretty much covered, but they also want to feel appreciated, man. Uh, you know, money is not the number one reason people quit jobs. It's number one is their immediate supervisor being a butt, and number two is not feeling appreciated. Money's like third or fourth down the road. I mean, that's yeah, that's you know, people think it's all about money, but it's not, and it's. And they say it's all about, you know, the Y generation, you know, or whatever, or what this generation, it don't matter who you are. Baby boomers feel that way. We all want to feel it. You know, we all want to feel appreciated. Uh, maybe some more than others, but you know, it's hard to put that team together. I mean, I'm not going to lie about it, but if you do that, and then when you do, like you say, find, come across somebody, even if you're not looking, you know, bring them in. If you got to get rid of somebody, get rid of a B player or a C player. Right. Right. I mean, you know, I mean, the deal is you, they're so hard to find, grab them. I mean, I, I hired a girl one time that was working at a hotel and I, and I just knew that she was the one to be at my receptionist because she was just the best. Yeah. And I told her, I said, I want to hire you, you know? And I said, uh, whatever you're making here, I'll offer you more. I don't know what it is. I said, but here's my card. Call me next week. Hey. And I hired her. Yeah, absolutely. Perfect. And you also mentioned like, well, you were talking about that. So you get, you, you should bring them on. I totally agree with you on that. But you were also talking about as a leader, as an owner of a business, that one of your biggest jobs is to continually train and mentor your team. And I've heard some people say, if I keep training them, you know, they're just going to find a better job. They're going to leave. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I think one of the most common retorts is that you know, your alternative is to not train them and have them stay. Yeah. But, but what are some of your retention strategies? Once you do get these A players, What's a great way to keep them with you and keep them engaged and keep them being a players? Yeah. Well, I think let them be involved as, you know, I use the Rockefeller habit slash scaling up and I teach that now. I actually got certified as a scaling up coach, burn harnish, um, mm -hmm. last year. And, uh, we're real big on, uh, daily huddles, weekly meetings, monthly meetings. And you say, I used to hate meetings, but. I love the way they got them structured and, you know, a lot of like the dailies last seven minutes, right. the weeklies last 45 minutes, the monthlies last about three hours. But the deal is you keep people involved. And then, like I was just saying, you let them know you appreciate what they're doing. You do call outs. I, I call them call outs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, if somebody does something that's pushing our uh, core values, uh, which is another thing we could talk about for two or three days, but. <laughs> you know, I used to think that was a bunch of crap too, but really core yeah. values are, are essential because we have them. It's just like we have a culture might not be the one you want, but you've got it in your law firm and you can either mold it or you can accept what you've got. <laughs> um, exactly. You know, but the deal is you want to hire people that's going to align with your core values and it's going to be a lot easier to deal with. But I think the deal, how you keep them is, you know, you pay them good. You show them, you appreciate them, you let, keep them involved. And I like to do what I call gamification. And that's kind of something that news out there. We have quarterly little goals and we, and we do it. We have celebrations when we hit up and it's not all about money. I mean, it's like, I've told them, if, you know, we got a membership drive. If we get this, you know, and we come up with little themes for it, we have a quarterly thing. And, uh, if we make it, then I'm going to take them all out, you know, whatever to dinner, or I'm going to send them, you know, some food baskets or whatever with this COVID going on. And uh, we right, got one yeah. for, we got an annual goal where I told them if we meet it, that, uh, we're closing down, we're going to the Caribbean for about four or five days. So the deal is that they got something to aspire to. They know you appreciate them. They see room that they can grow in your business and you make it fun. I mean, you know, and you keep them informed what's going on you know it's not to just uh you know show up do your job you know shut up yeah uh you know I, I like to get feedback you know we do a monthly survey of our employees i mean this is another thing you can do if you've never heard about it I, i'm we've been doing surveys but now i'm gonna go to the what they call the uh employee promoter net score you know you had the pr uh, yeah, net promoter yeah. score for a customers we're getting ready to implement the net promoter score for employees oh that's cool but the deal is you want to know if you can find out you know like what one of the things we have to like 
on a scale of one to 10, how happy are you with your job? You know, what is it that you want to learn or, or be better at? Or what is it that you feel like, you know, you're not getting enough access to or you get feedback so that you can keep these people and make them happy because they're happy. They're not going anywhere. Yep. Now, you know, and I know some of the lawyers right there going to say, Hey, listen, I write a check. They do what I say, do well, that's fine, but you're not going to get a players to stay with you. If you, if you got that attitude, it, it's uh, like a meal house. It's not going to work. You know, you're not going to get a plus players that are professional to stay with you because you're looking for something for more than just a job. I can promise you. Yeah, that makes total sense. All right, we're talking with Ken Hardison. Uh, he's the founder of Pilma, and we've been talking about the importance of mindset and uh, the importance of team in growing your law firm business um, and be having it be the business that works for you. Uh, we're going to hear one more word from our sponsors. And Ken, when we come back, I want to shift gears again and talk a little bit about execution, how the individual lawyer can get more things done in a year and move their business forward. And if we've got a little bit of time, we'll talk to you about cash flow as well. But first, we'll uh, hear from our sponsors. Now more than ever, an effective marketing strategy is one of the most important things for your firm. Scorpion can help. With nearly 20 years of experience serving the legal industry, Scorpion has proven methods to help you get the high value cases you deserve. Join thousands of attorneys across the country who have turned to Scorpion for effective marketing and technology solutions. For a better way to grow your practice, visit scorpionlegal.com. No one cites routine drafting as the reason they chose to become a lawyer, but that's where a lot of time goes for solo practitioners and small firms. LawYaw can help you transform your existing Word documents into reusable templates with no coding required. Save time and avoid errors with intuitive features like conditional logic. Use a tool that empowers your experience and expertise. Learn more at LawYaw.com, and that's L-A-W-Y-A-W.com. And we're back with the Unbillable Hour. Ken Hardison is the founder of Pilma, the powerful innovative legal marketing and management association we've been talking about all things to do with growing your law firm business and doing so successfully without you know having a whole ton of necessarily having a whole ton of money to do it with we've talked about mindset we've talked about the importance of an a team and how to get them when to get them and how to keep them there so let's circle a little bit back to i don't want to go back to the discussion of you know i'm too busy but rather, how can lawyers do more with the time they've got? How can lawyers get more things done each year so that they can stay on top of it in front of their law firm and get it moving? Yeah, you know, I think the big deal is you've got to figure out this. This is what I think. And this is just my viewpoint. I think you got to figure out what you're really good at and kind of focus on that and then hire people to do stuff you're not good at. But that's just the beginning, mm -hmm. because here's what here's what I used to fall into the trap. I'd have these great ideas. I said, okay, we're going to do this, this, and this, this year, or maybe five things I wanted to do or eight things. And, and then I just trust my people to get it done. And then about in October, November, <laughs> I think about, well, where are we at on this? And everybody's scaring around, you know, the deal is the key to the execution, of course, is being clear with what you want. But I think it's all, it's all about accountability. As I often said, people respect what you inspect. And that don't mean you got to be a micromanager by any means of imagination. You can do it with a weekly meeting of about five to seven minutes. That's what right. we do. What I preach now is I read this book called, uh, I think it's a 12 week year. And I don't really follow the whole deal, but, but I got so many good nuggets out of it. So what we do now is we figure out what our big annual goals are, but then we break it down. And, okay, what are we going to do quarterly right. projects on top of everything else that we're doing just to keep, you know, our daily tasks. And I'm really thinking quarterly and chopping things up into quarterly and then having what I like to do. I'll just tell you how I do it with Pillman. I think law firms ought to do it. We have a workshop, we have quarterly meetings and we have a workshop and we decide, of course, I'm the dictator, benevolent dictator. I, I get to say what we are going to do, but I, I let them participate because I want to hear maybe they got an idea that I hadn't ever thought about. But we'll pick three to five projects, depending on how big they are. That has nothing to do with our regular duties. Right. Things that we want to try to accomplish. And we will, uh, and sometimes we have to get outside people to come in to do it. But we still have somebody to hold them accountable. Right. And we figure out, okay, this is what we want to do. And we workshop it back and forth. You know, everybody makes a list. I put it on the board. We go through it, da, da, da. But then we come out, okay, this is, this is this first project. 
Now, what everybody right now, what individual tasks got to be done? Then we agree on that. Then we agree on who's going to do it. And then we agree on a date. Okay. We just agreed on the whole quarter of what we're going to do to get this project done. And everybody, and I always ask them, don't tell me what you want me to hear. Tell me what you can promise me you can get done on this date. Right. Because we can't do the next thing till you get done with this. And, you know, I built several houses and I don't know if you have Chris, but that's the thing that are key on a house is a subcontractor promising to be there one day. Right. And he's there two weeks late and then everybody else gets put off and then they got to go to other jobs. And then, you know, a six month job ends up being 14 months because people don't do what they're supposed to. They don't show up at the time. They don't get their tests done. They don't get the work done. So, you know, what we do is a weekly scorecard where everybody, uh, and we got a project management software that we use loosely. I mean, it's not like a, like I said, we don't, which one do you use? Basecamp. Basecamp. Got it. Okay. Yeah. I don't use it a lot. And, that, and that's one of my weaknesses, to be honest with you. I've never been a technology guy, as y'all figured out when we were getting ready for this thing today. But I've always just hired people to do stuff like that. I mean, I don't even know how to type. So, I mean, that goes back to what you were saying before about know what you're good at, know what you like yeah, doing. And, and then, yeah. you know what? You have a project. You don't have to be a technologist. And I think this yeah. is really important for the lawyers to hear. You don't have to be a technologist to implement project management software or case no. management software no. or anything because. Maybe that's something for your team to do. Yeah. I mean, listen, I don't even like managing. I mean, you know, I got someone else <laughs> manages. I mean, you know, I, yeah. I like leading and I like uh, being the visionary. And I like, believe it or not, I like writing copy, which is probably not the best use of my time, but I enjoy it for ads and stuff. And so I do it. You know, I write a lot of commercials for TV, a lot of lawyers on TV all the time. I enjoy that. I think I'm good at it. I enjoy it. And that's part of being, uh, you know, having a strength, a unique strength is something that you have a desire to do, a passion that you enjoy. It gives you joy. Usually those things, you're usually damn good at them. Yeah. You know, because yeah. you're not going to be passionate about something that you're terrible at. I mean, you know, but, but yeah, and I think when you do it that way and break it down quarterly and do it, you can see, you can have the little themes and you can have the celebrations. And what we've done since we started that about three or four years ago, Chris, we're getting like three times as much done every year at Pilma. And, yeah. and the lawyers that I've got to doing it, they're just seeing wild successes. Now, the problem is you got to have somebody, a gatekeeper, to make sure that, because usually the lawyer's not going to be the one. So I've, I've got, you know, it's got to be an office manager or somebody that's going to hold your feet to the fire, too. And I yes. think yes. I've always hired somebody that was strong enough that won't scare it on me because a lot of people, you know, the lawyer, everybody's scared of the head partner. I, I said, if you're scared of me, you can't do your job here. Cause sometimes you got to call me out. Cause I'm not, I'm like everybody else. Sometimes yeah. We all, a, we all get full of our own stuff sometimes. And yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm going to kind of put stuff that I don't really enjoy doing to the back burner. Right. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm not unique. I'm like everybody else. So sometimes somebody has got to call me out on it and say, okay, you promised you'd have this done. So, you know, I think that's the big, that's the big deal. It, and that goes back. If you think about it to my focus and discipline. If you yeah. think about everything I just talked about, those two words run through everything I was just talking about. Indeed. Uh, and do. the deal is you, you just can't get sidetracked. I mean, you know, you got to have that focused and, uh, and have those, you know, and do those things. That's how you get stuff done. In my opinion, if you try to do it all yourself, I mean, I had a lawyer that called me last week. He, he'd been in a mastermind. He quit. He just could never get nothing done. He come back and he just said, Oh, he called me. He said, can I just don't know what to do? I said, well, here's what we do know. You're not going to do it. I said, so here's the deal. You're going to pay me X dollar amount of dollars. I'm going to go hire you a marketing assistant that's going to implement everything that you know you ought to be doing. And you're going to pay her. And we're going to hold her accountable. You know, we're going to set up benchmarks. And, and he said, uh, well, what if she don't work out? I said, what have you got to lose? What, what are you doing now? Right. What you're doing now is not working. I mean, you know. So sometimes, you know, this, I mean, nice lawyer, good lawyer, right intentions, but he just won't get it done. I mean, you know, and that's okay. I won't, I don't get a lot of stuff done. That's why I hire people, you know, yeah. but he, but exactly. he don't want to spend the money. So sometimes he, you, if you can't get to it or you, you know, you don't like it or you're lazy or whatever the reason is just hire people. I mean, you know, just hire the A players. Don't, don't hire these. Yeah. Yeah. So let me take that thought though about hiring. Cause we've already said in this show, like when the A player shows up, go ahead and hire them. We've, we've now talked about, you know, getting people to help. 
And I know as some people are listening to this, they're thinking, oh yeah, that's great. I am like on a razor's edge for profitability as it is. How can I increase my cash flow? Do I need to go out there in order to implement what you're talking about? Do I need to borrow a lot of money? Can we just talk for a few minutes about cash flow and how yeah. to do these things without borrowing? Yeah, there, there's a thing called the seven levers of cash flow, and it's in the Scaling Up book by Bern Harnish. And I won't get into all of it, but there's like three big deals you can do. There's seven, but I'm going to talk about three or four very quickly. Right. It is number one is there's these certain things that you can just increase or decrease by one to 10%. Mm-hmm. It can make a big, big difference in your bottom line. I mean, big. And when you do them all together, it compounds. It's just amazing. So one thing is price. And if you bill hourly, you got you need to go look up, and I'm not going to explain it because we don't have time. Look up price elasticity. Yes. But the bottom line is you're scared to charge enough what you're worth. And if you'll raise your prices and you and watch it and see what your conversions are, you'll you'll read you'll reach a sweet spot. If you're doing a contingency work, I just did this with several lawyers. I had a lawyer been charging the same thing 25% for the last 10 years on it. And I said, uh, you need to go up 38%. He said, I can't do that. I said, why not? He said, they won't hire me. I said, I promise you, if somebody bulks about it, go down on the price. After six months, I said, how many people balked about it? He said, one. Yep. I said, okay, how much that extra 13% of $3 million is how much? You see what I'm saying? That's yep. a yep. lot of money. That's a lot of money. I mean, that's bottom line. Without you, doing any more work or hiring any more team or anything no, else, it's just boom, no, $400,000. Yep, just that one thing. you know. And, and people are scared to do it because they're afraid people won't hire them. But I'm telling you, 99.9% of them are not going to care if you're a good lawyer. They just want you. They came to you because of what you do. They're not buying. When it comes to legal and doctors, they're not buying based on price, I can promise you. Yep. Especially the more serious it is. And then the second thing is cutting your expenses. And that, everybody talks about that. But what I like to do, and I've seen lawyers do it, especially with this pandemic around, go through your P&L and look at everything line item and ask this question, will this make me money directly or indirectly? And then if that's not enough, they go back, will this make me money directly? <laughs> you know, yeah. and dock out the indirectly. But the deal is you can come through and shroud it out, but don't do like, Everybody wants to cut their marketing first thing. I know. That's like the, like, and that's like cutting off the umbilical cord to a baby. Yeah, it's the opposite of what you just said. Yeah. If uh, go through there, is this going to make me money directly or maybe indirectly? Yeah. And then don't cut that. Uh -uh. (laughs) Go, go cut the other stuff. Yeah, the other stuff. The stuff that you've been doing for 20 years, like the country club dues or, you know, or, or or these meals or, or I don't know, whatever, whatever it might be. But, uh, you know, that and just working out a deal. Okay. If you're doing a, a contingency firm, a time on desk. Yeah. You know that's a saying? huge killer. You know what I'm saying? Because if you can compress it and get the same results, then you don't, it's like Dell computers. <laughs> that's how they got so rich. They, they figured out that they did, they did, you know, the less inventory you got to work on it, you can keep pushing it out without you got to give good quality services now, believe me. I mean, I'm not saying that, but there's a lot of things I see that, that lawyers do. They just let stuff lay around like wine. think it's going to get more valuable and it don't. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, so it don't price, matter. expenses, what's, uh, you, you said there's a third one. That would be your accounts payables and your accounts receivables. Nice, yeah. Yeah, because you want to get a, you want to kind of work out a deal with your vendors that you say, listen, I, I know everybody pays 30 days, but I'm going to pay 60 days. That's just the way it's going to be. I mean, I got a guy that does TV now. He pays his TV stations 90 days after he runs the ads. Wow. And he's been doing it for five years. And, and, I, and I thought he was crazy. How'd you do him a due date? So I just told him I won't buy it if I didn't do it. He said, that way I get 90 days, you know, free long. Oh, um, what it means is that he probably gets, because we shouldn't do any marketing unless it returns us more than we spend, right? Right. So, so he's getting back a lot of what he spent before he has to pay it. Yeah. And then the accounts uh, receivables, make sure you get these bills out and make sure you make them put in retainers to where if it gets below a thousand dollars, they got to feed it again, like feeding the, like one of these automatic dog feeders. I mean, you yeah. just want to keep filling it up because we'll stay, you know, if you don't, uh, you know, you think about it and I've seen lawyers like this. And this is one reason I quit doing that billable hours because I, I was terrible at this, Chris, I hated going after people for money. Uh, yeah. I, I, it was just because I always felt like two things happened if I didn't, and I didn't do it the right way. Like what I'm telling people to do now is that I'm going to 
make them mad with me. They'll never come back. It's like, you know, and, and then the deal is, you know, or if I sue them or whatever, you know, they're going to come back and make some bar complaint. It's always something, you know what I'm saying? I was, I felt like I was in a no win situation. Yeah. Uh, and so the deal was, but I didn't, I wasn't smart enough back then. I didn't have enough experience. You know what I should have done is say, listen, put me up $5,000 when it gets below 2000, you got to refill it or I'm start making my motion to get out of the case. You know, and just just be firm with it. I mean, and when you know, they know the rules, they respect it. It's it's yeah. It's, you know, just think about those three or four things right there you could do, and, and really the two biggest expenses, and, and I think price price increases number one. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's like a uh, Pilma. I just increased the prices in Pilma. I hadn't done it in two or three years. Should have done it last year, but the pandemic. I was going to do it first quarter last year, and then you know what happened. Yeah. So I just didn't feel right about doing it with everybody. You know. But I, I decided to go ahead and I'm going to do it anyway. You yep. know? And so we lost maybe two or three members, but look how much more we got. And then we got more operating capital. Now I can go out and hire another person. And you can actually give your members a better experience. Absolutely. I'm going yeah. to get, I'm going out and hire me another marketing person to, to help get some of the stuff implemented. Yeah. And that's what lawyers also need to hear that too. You can raise, when you raise your prices, not only can that improve your bottom line, but you can do more for your clients. You can afford to, take a little bit longer, take a little bit deeper look, put the, get a team players on their cases instead of B team players on their cases. There's a lot you can do. Ken, we are out of time. Um, I want to thank you so much for being on the show. Could you tell our listeners, I'm sure there's stuff they want to learn about you or about Pilma or about some of the stuff we talked about. What's the best way for them to get in touch with you? Ken at Pilma.org, P-I-L-M-M-A dot O-R-G, or just go to Pilma.org. We've got a lot of free resources there, Chris. I've actually got a calculator that's free on the non-member resources that you can punch in numbers and say, if I increase my fees to this. Oh, nice. Yeah. You can take your P&L and do that. Or if I cut my expenses by 10%, it'll actually generate and show you how much money you'll make. And it's free. Absolutely free. That'll be great. And I'll just repeat that real quick. That's Ken at P-I-L-M-M-A.org. Um, or the website is P-I-L-M-M-A.org, Pilma.org for the website. Ken, thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate it. My pleasure. And that wraps up this edition of the Unbillable Hour. Thank you all for listening. My guest today, once again, has been Ken Hardison. He's the founder of Pilma, which is the powerful, innovative, legal marketing and management association. And of course, I am Christopher Anderson, and I look forward to seeing you next month with another great guest as we learn more about topics that help us build the law firm business that works for you. Remember, you can subscribe to all the editions of this podcast at LegalTalkNetwork.com or on iTunes. Thanks for joining us. We'll speak again soon. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by Legal Talk Network, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, and subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer. Thanks for listening to the Unbillable Hour, the Law Practice Advisory Podcast. Join us again for the next edition, right here with Legal Talk Network.